Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute podcast. I'm your host, Rowena Itchon. This is part two of our podcast on the Supreme Court with Dean McGrath. If you missed part one, go to the previous week's episode. Our guest is Dean McGrath, a Georgetown law professor who also has a private practice. Dean was Deputy Chief of Staff to Vice President Dick Cheney. He also served three presidents, including as Associate Counsel to President Reagan, which allowed him to get an insider's view of the nomination process for Supreme Court justices. Tim and I, PRI's Director of Communications, and I chatted with Dean on the impact of some of the High Court's recent decisions and the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh as the next justice. Here's part two. So before we get into his record and the confirmation fight, let's talk a little bit about Judge Kavanaugh as a person. What's his background and what have your experiences and interactions with him been like? I don't know exactly how long an overlap we had. When when Brett was staff secretary after being an associate counsel to the president for about a year, and I didn't have any interactions with him when he was in the counsel's office, but when he was staff secretary, I did. I was deputy chief of staff to Vice President Cheney, and eventually attended most of the White House uh, the White House staff meetings early each morning. And Brett was there as the staff secretary, so we we had you know some interactions then. I also over the years run into him in the halls of Georgetown Law School, where he has taught classes and at various professional functions, judicial conferences. That that said, I don't I don't know him socially, just just professionally. He's a native Washingtonian, grew up in suburban Maryland. His mother was a prosecutor, then a judge. Father was a non-practicing lawyer, and he attended Georgetown Prep, which is a Jesuit Catholic uh, high school in suburban D.C., right across the border in Maryland. Professionally, I mean, his qualifications are first rate. Yale undergraduate, Yale Law School, clerked for Justice Kennedy, worked for Justice Judge Starr worked in the council and staff secretary's office for President uh, George W. Bush. He's been on the D.C. circuit for 12 years. More than 50 percent of his clerks have been women, various ethnic and political perspectives. Personally, White House romance. He married President Bush's confidential assistant, taught at Harvard Law School, which as a Yale graduate is a high hurdle to get over. It heavily involved in kind of casual Catholic Charities, does meals for the homeless, coached his daughter's basketball teams. I, I've forgotten where I read it, but he's clearly not a member of the uh, Georgetown Cocktail Circus Circuit. All indications there, he's, he's, he's a good choice. Smart, hardworking, well-respected, and a generally nice guy. I mean, that clearly re- reflects my limited experience with him. So, I mean, I you know, I think the background is he's eminently qualified. He has the background that will make him a thoughtful justice. I know of nothing in his background that should cause anybody angst over his uh, nomination. Dean, in the run-up to the Kavanaugh nomination, conservative groups were in overdrive over the four finalists. And following the experiences with past Republican appointees who turned out to be actually rather quite liberal on the bench, there is some angst in conservative quarters. So, should conservatives fear that we have another closet liberal justice in Brett Kavanaugh, or should we cheer that we have a conservative upgrade from Justice Kennedy? One of the things on the appointment process process that that's probably worth noting is that when you try and predict who where the justices will come down some history is kind of relevant like president reagan had three appointments justice o'connor justice Scalia, and justice kennedy I think conservatives would almost certainly classify Scalia as a true conservative, and I think tenure proved that out. On the other hand, O'Connor and Kennedy are probably much more to their liking than, say, Ford's selection of Stevens, Nixon's selection of Blackman, or Eisenhower's selection of Warren, another California. Also, it's hard to classify a justice until after he's been on the court for some period. Take, for example, Bush's appointments of Thomas, who turned out to be a very, very philosophically conservative slash uh, kind of libertarian 
jury and or and Justice Souter turned out to be, you know, very, very liberal. But even Democratic precedent. When when Roosevelt appointed Frankfurter, who'd been the liberal guru of the New Deal, he turned out to be a very conservative justice. So it's it, it's hard hard to predict where a justice will come out. That's why kind of the 12 years of Kavanaugh's experience on the D.C. Circuit, his experience in the executive branch, I think give us a higher indication, but no guarantee about where he would come down. So let's get into the issues that Judge Kavanaugh can expect to be asked about during the hearings. First, there's an issue with his past writings on executive power. Uh, He wrote a 2009 article giving his thoughts on whether a sitting president can be uh, criminally indicted. The left is seen on this to try and deduce how he'd uh, rule on uh, potential Trump cases. Uh, You're a law professor at Georgetown teaching a class on the Constitution and presidential powers. What does that article and his past rulings say about his views on executive power? Well, first of all, the article was a 2009 Minnesota Law Review. Part of what he said is the law is settled. After the Supreme Court's consideration in the issue of Paula Jones and President Clinton, it's clear the president can be, as Judge Kavanaugh said, the law is settled. The president can be subject to criminal, civil, subpoena, testimony by a court. So what the article said is, as a practical, not a constitutional legal matter, Congress should pass law laws, legislation to defer criminal prosecution, civil cases, subpoenas, and testimony of a sitting president until after the president leaves off. He also indicated that in the sense of serious presidential misconduct, egregious activities, that a sitting president is subject to congressional impeachment and removal, at which point he would be subject to the criminal and legal processes since that that would be in the deferral. Also, with respect to the pardon power, a president can't pardon himself from impeachment. So the law review, I think, massively mischaracterizes what Judge Kavanaugh's position is. That said, he has generally been on separation of powers positions. One of the things that he's been essentially says that the congressional legislation and restrictions on presidential power need to comply with the constitutional provisions. So in that sense, my guess is somewhat in the the line of Justice Kennedy, particularly in the area of foreign affairs, is deferential to presidential decisions. So the predictable strategy of left-wing groups is to attack Judge Kavanaugh as being anti-woman and the deciding vote to end Roe v. Wade. And you saw moments after the nomination was announced, Senator Elizabeth Warren was predictably out in front of the Supreme Court, Riley up the crowd on this front. What does his record say about how he would approach Roe and uh, various privacy issues uh, that would come before him on the court? There's no evidence that Judge Kavanaugh is that woman. To the contrary, as Amy uh, Chow, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who was a member of Yale Law School's clerkship committee, noted in a Wall Street Journal op-ed, Judge Kavanaugh has been an exemplary mentor to women clerks. His clerks have been racially and ethnically diverse, and he's used no ideological test for their selection. She said her daughter had clerked for Judge Kavanaugh. She hoped she'd apply for a clerkship with a Justice Kavanaugh, and she was 100% behind it. So I, I, I think there's no merit to the allegation that he's anti-woman. The breadth and disingenuousness of the allegations, including the one that, you know, decades ago when he, he clerked for Kaczynski, who's recently been implicated in sexual harassment, that he, he knew or should have known and failed to reveal, reveal this and therefore is unfit to serve on the Supreme It just shows the lengths to which his opponents will go. With respect 
respect to Roe versus Wade, my guess, and I don't think he's written anything on this, that he doesn't agree with the substantive due process approach taken by the court and in particular Justice Blackmun in the original Roe decision, somewhat refined and reaffirmed in Casey. I'm pretty sure he doesn't believe in penumbral rights emanating from the Constitution. As he said, he believes in the text of the Constitution. That said, and notwithstanding the apocryphal claims made by Senator Warren and others that Judge Kavanaugh's a lock to overturn Roe, my guess, and no one including Senator Warren and maybe even Judge Kavanaugh himself knows, I certainly don't, what he would do on overturning Roe. Uh, my guess is that based on stare decisis, He'd be very reluctant to overturn a precedent of almost 50 years that was reconsidered and rejected 20 years after it was first decided. For what it's worth, I'm not sure he would be the deciding vote on the issue. I think some of the issues that have been raised with respect to stare decisis would be raised and carefully considered by other justices. With respect to privacy issues more generally, the the court this past term decided Carpenter versus U.S. was dealt with kind of the privacy of cell phones. In that case, the government had used the cell phone records on location of where the cell phone was to help convict an individual of robbery as being at the time and near the place where the robbery occurred. And Justice Roberts found that there should have been a warrant under the Fourth Amendment. I raise that because that almost certainly that the application of the Constitution to social media metadata used by the government for law enforcement and national security will almost certainly come before the court. I don't know where Judge Kavanaugh will come down on those issues, but I think they will be vitally important ones. And I'm almost certain that some of those are going to come before the court. So after the Chief Justice went the other way on Obamacare, Judge Kavanaugh's record on health care will be scrutinized even more. Looking at his past record at the White House and on the D.C. Circuit, who will have more heartburn from his record on health care? you think the left or the right? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. The case that is cited on the Obamacare issue and that Kavanaugh is being criticized for involved the constitutionality of Obamacare when it came before the D.C. Circuit. What what Judge Kavanaugh did was he held that the individual mandate penalty was a tax. And because of that, the case was barred by the um, Anti-Injunction Act, which barred bringing the case until the tax was actually due and paid or challenged. That's being characterized as supporting Obamacare. It's not. It, it was the case shouldn't have been allowed to move forward in its uh, current status. What Justice Roberts did was he found that the individual mandate penalty was not a tax for purposes of the Anti-Injunction Act, but was a tax for purposes of constitutional authority to support Obamacare. The Supreme Court, yes, it agreed with Judge Kavanaugh that the individual mandate penalty was a tax, but his point really was that the case should have been dismissed for violation of the Anti-Justice Act. A couple of other things that he'll probably get asked about and will decline to mention is the there's a case in Texas which brings another allegation against Obamacare that it's raises constitutional concerns because of the passage of the Tax Act last year. That one is in a very, very preliminary change 
I can't see it probably coming to the Supreme Court. And if it comes to the court, it will be a long time off. The other area that's probably worth mentioning that that's come up, some of it kind of silly about how Judge Kavanaugh should recuse himself from all investigations of the president and because the Mueller investigation involves the president, he should recuse himself. Former Deputy White House Counsel Tim Flanagan has kind of dismissed that. Um, the other one, which is even more silly, is that he should recuse himself uh, from any matters involving President Trump because he was appointed by President Trump. That would result in some really bizarre recusals. So uh, many of the charges against Judge Kavanaugh are political. They're not judicial qualifications. They're not that he's unqualified. It's that they think that they would upset the policy positions that they advocate. So Dean Senator Chuck Schumer has said that while using every bit of his power to try and stop the Kavanaugh nomination, he wants the debate to focus on economic issues as well. You know, he wants to be able to brand Judge Kavanaugh as being on the side of corporate interests and polluters. So based on his record, how can we expect him to side on cases involving economic freedom? First of all, I think post Lochner, which was the kind of height and poster child, if you will, for the idea that the Supreme Court would review kind of the economic freedoms arguments. And the post-Lochner approach has been that the court basically defers to the legislative branch on economic regulation. If there's a reasonable basis for it, the court's not going to substitute its judgment about the merits of the economic legislation. So uh, I, I don't really see Judge Kavanaugh as trying to undermine that judicial doctrine. So I, I think he is evidence of support for deferring to legislative judgments and the text of the statute they approve. As I mentioned earlier, regardless of the economic activity involved, he's more likely to defer to the statutory text than to the agency's interpretation of their own authority, re-examining the Chevron doctrine, if you will. So to the extent that the economic freedom arguments are out there, he probably is not going to be markedly different than where the the court is generally. Having said that, he will look into the appropriateness of the mechanisms that Congress chooses to enforce you know, various regulatory regimes. He, he, he has a skepticism towards unaccountable agencies, the Consumer Financial Protection Board, entities that purport to no one. I think he's skeptical of. In that sense, he's more aligned with kind of, you know, the, the president needs to have some authority over him because he's the only elected enforcer of the law so that democratic principles say that there needs to be some politically accountable official responsible for the agency's activities. So, like most of other things Schumer has raised, they're all, whether he likes the results or not, whether his members like the results or not, it's not how the justices analyze the issue or come to the conclusions they will. On that score, Judge Kavanaugh, I think, is well within the body of justices that currently sit on the court. So as we wrap up, let's honor the legacy of Justice Kennedy and give our best wishes to Judge Kavanaugh for a good tenure on the court with a toast. So what favorite wine, beer, or other adult beverage would you recommend that we pour to toast these two major legal figures? First of all, I close by agreeing with 
Mike Gerson, uh, who was communications director at the White House when Judge Kavanaugh was there, he summed it up by saying Judge Kavanaugh is committed to the Bill of Rights and the rule of law. He's brilliant, meticulous, fair-minded, and unfailingly decent. For somebody like that, once confirmed, I'd recommend the classic toast, champagne with as many tiny bubbles as finances allow. Very good. Well, Dean, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, It's been my pleasure. Thanks to our guest, Dean McGrath of McGrath & Associates, and to my colleague, Tim Anaya. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's a number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Itchon. We hope you'll come back again for another episode of PRI's podcast.